Welcome to Bike Life Radio from KWNK 97.7 FM, Reno Bike Project and BikeWashow.org in Reno, Nevada. We ride our bikes out into the world with a recorder and talk to people about their bikes and their lives. I'm Kai Plaskon. Ride on. Today, we're talking to a guy who hopes to produce a documentary about the legendary black cyclist Major Taylor. Cyril Vincent has raised $40,000, and he's coming to Reno September 22nd to give a talk at 7 p.m. at the Reno Public Market. September 22nd, 7 p.m., Reno Public Market. Then we take a trip to Food Truck Friday, and we chat to people who brought their bikes to the new Bike Valet, sponsored by the event Food Truck Friday and uh, the Reno Bike Project, too. Before we get to all that, the news. In Japan, the U.S. Army has been deployed to round up bicycles and put stickers on them. They want bikes on the base to be registered. The bike market is expected to grow 8% next year worldwide. 80% of the market is in North America and Europe. Road bikes and men are 70 and 75% of the market respectively. The growth is expected to come from the technology sector, specifically apps that offer bike share. Yulu and Pony are to name a few of those apps, um, and they're really popular in India and Europe right now. In Toronto, a 17-year-old girl driving a car tried to hit an officer on a bike. The officer just jumped off his bike to avoid getting hit. The driver faces eight charges now, two of them assault with a deadly weapon. In national bike news, the deadliest places in the U.S. for cyclists are Tucson, Arizona, Detroit, Michigan, and Jacksonville, Florida. To put that in perspective, Jacksonville just reported 100 deaths in 209 days, one every other day. The news reports that the city is trying to make roads safer with a goal of zero fatalities by 2030 in just seven years. Part of the plan is to improve bike parking. So far, they aren't making a lot of progress. In Portland, cyclists are suing the city for not complying with state law that requires cities to build cycling and pedestrian infrastructure whenever a road is rebuilt. The plaintiffs say they are harmed. There's over a dozen of them, and they say that they're harmed because the city isn't following state law. One cyclist became a paraplegic on streets that have have been reconstructed without cycling facilities. An article in Momentum magazine is calling for more bike parking in the United States. It says that in other cities, people pay 28 bucks a month for their secured bike parking spot. In Idaho, you can ride your bike on the freeway. The Department of Transportation has even issued a bike freeway map showing the width of the shoulder in certain spots. Cyclists can ride next to each other too on the freeway. There is no mention of injuries as a result of riding on the freeway. Nevada is one of 11 states listed where you can ride a bike on the freeway. But be sure to check signs before you enter the freeway in Nevada. Last week, I saw people on bird scooters on the I-580 going south. You're listening to KWNK 97.7 FM in local bike news from Bike Life Radio and BikeWashoe.org. Up in South Lake Tahoe, Caltrans will not be increasing the speed limit on Highway 50. They are not raising the speed limit after cyclists and pedestrians made a big stink about the plan to increase deadly speeds. On the hill in Sacramento, a driver in a rage ran over a bicycle advocate. The driver is facing a felony on assault with a deadly weapon. A letter writing campaign is underway to encourage the DA to prosecute the driver to the fullest extent of the law. Here in Reno, a cyclist was killed on Geiger Grade on July 6 when the truck didn't stop at a stop sign and pulled right out in front of the cyclist. Reno police and the city did a sweep of homeless camps recently. Of the 59 tents, 13 of them were used for storing bike parts. The city used a bulldozer to scoop up everyone's stuff and throw it in dumpsters. Phase one of the Audi Wells project is almost done. This $52 million project includes a new roadway, center median raised cycle track, 490 new trees, street lighting, and ADA sidewalks. That's it for bike news from bikewashow.org and Bike Life Radio. A reminder, the Bike Life Radio airs on the first Sunday of every month at noon, right here on KWNK 97.7 FM. (laughs) 
Today on Bike Life Radio, have you heard of Major Taylor? Not a lot of people have, but I wasn't one of them. Uh, I didn't hear about him until the Reno Bike Project's Major Taylor Bike Camp. I signed up my kids for that camp, and then I wondered who Major Taylor was. Uh, that, that camp is sponsored by NDOT. So then I started to learn about who Major Taylor is, a, a legendary black cyclist that started in the 1890s and overcame racial barriers to win lots of races. Now award-winning producer Cyril Vincent is raising funds to do a documentary about him. He's coming to Reno on September 22nd to give a talk at the Reno Public Market, and then we will have a bike film festival afterwards. You can come to the free event. Go to bikewasho.org for details. Now we have a little preview. Uh, with who? Well, C. Rowe Vincent himself. Here he is. My hope is that, you know, I can um, inspire the next generation of athletes with the story of Major Taylor. His sportsmanship, his discipline, his faith and commitment to, uh, to cycling is something that I found really extraordinary especially when you put the story into a uh, context, right, into the time that it is unfolding. For a little background, historian consider, first of all, he was born pretty much 13 years shy um, of uh, the abolition of uh, slavery. Uh, historian consider that period of time between 1878 and the 1900s, as uh, the nadi of race relations, which means this is a time where it was very difficult for uh, Black people in general um, to express uh, their humanity and what they were capable to accomplish as human beings. And here is a gentleman that was born in Indianapolis um, and that is able to get to the top of the cycling, which cycling was pretty much the biggest part of all back then. Uh, and, you know, which mean, you know, many people were watching what was going on and knew what was going on in the cycling wall and most likely white people. And this young man uh, managed, you know, also I want to mention the Jim Crow era that was going on, which is pretty much a codifying way of segregation. So it wasn't the law that, you know, black and white can't use the same facility, can't, um, can't marry, uh, and a bunch of other things that were just inhumane. Uh, but somehow, Mr. Taylor managed to be at the top of the uh, biggest game of the time. Um, so I found in his story just um, something so motivating and so inspiring uh, because after all, um, life, um, you know, beyond sport, life is full of obstacles, you know, like and difficulties. And we're not always going to... Um, uh, get what we want or what we plan for and situation are not always going to be fair and I'm not talking just about race I'm just talking about common activity of human uh, uh, existence or civilization right we especially in capitalism always trying to take advantage of other people we we want to think that we're trying to work harder than other people but in the most cases is really trying to take advantage of other people um you know be it by selling them the wrong product or whatever that is um so having this young man um being focused on the big picture and complaining about you know all the unfairness and all the 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 wrongdoing um I, I thought it was really inspiring and again because whatever we do right sometime we're going to feel like this we weren't treated fairly or that we did not have all the means um to do the things that we want to do uh you know it it could be being born in a poor family or you know being born with a disease or uh get involved in an accident or or maybe somebody stole something from you or said the wrong thing to you things are not always going to be um right and straight um but major teller have proved to us that um, you know, um, no matter, no matter that, um, you can, you can find a way 
to navigate and and by focusing on the big picture. And in many cases, uh, if you do so and uh, are adamant about it and, and committed about it, there's a lot of chance that um, these things will reinforce your personality and make you come out of that adversity much more greater than where you start. So I really thought that um, this is a story that needs to be told, especially because as a filmmaker, I did look around and I did not find, you know, I found so many things about so many documentaries and films about Jesse Owen in tennis, uh, Jack Johnson in boxing, uh, uh, Jackie Robinson in baseball, Michael Jordan in, you know, Serena Williams. I mean, you will find so much great films and biopics and documentary, but really there's nothing out there about Major Taylor. And for me, it was unconceivable, uh, especially because this is a pioneer in cycling, but athleticism in general. He came, uh, his story, you know, happened 100 years and 50 years. Uh, before all of these people that I have mentioned. And for me, I think that um, if there was a documentary or a film to be made first, with all due respect to all these great athletes that came after him, but Major Taylor really deserved to have his own uh, film and documentary, and not just any kind, something that would be to the high standing and high quality, um, you know, of, and respecting the work that he has done. Because uh, if it was just about making a video or something, you know, that people can watch and know about the story, we can do that. That would not take me a day or a month to do it. Uh, but I wanted to do something that can leave people in an, oh, wow, this is great story, but it was also told with great care. I, I need to remind the the listeners here that we're talking to Ciro Vincent, uh, who's the documentary producer of uh, Major Taylor documentary producers. He, he's aspiring to produce a documentary about Major Taylor, a cycling champion in the 1890s. Uh, he is coming to Reno on September 22nd um, to give a presentation at the Reno Public Market. That starts at 7 p.m. and we're also going to have a uh, film festival afterwards. Um, but what I want to talk to you about really briefly is you just went on a ride to raise funds uh, for your documentary. Somewhere You're around somewhere about 3000 of a $100,000 goal, um, and you went on this bike ride to raise funds. Are, are you experiencing some of... The, uh, some of the racism that that uh, of the past today, or even racism today, and can you give us examples of how you might be experiencing it? I am sure that there is some, um, but again, coming with the perspective of Mr. Taylor, I um, I usually don't focus on the negative things, right? Like it may even be happening around me, but I'm so busy doing what I want to do and what I want to accomplish that sometimes I don't even realize it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, um, an experience like uh, Rackbri, where I just uh, came from, you know, the, the ride across Iowa is a 500 mile. Overall, I want to say I had a very great experience and I think this is probably one of my greatest life experience. Um, uh, don't get me wrong, it was a brutal ride, you know, like uh, more than 18,000 feet of climb, elevation climb, uh, 500 mile uh, in the heat. And, uh, you know, you have to carry some of your gear. So there's not a lot of uh, shade, like, um, you know, it's pretty much open. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> so yeah. it's, it's a lot of corn field, a lot of uh, farmers and um, so you feel the heat, you feel the heat, and sometimes the humidity is also uh, very killing. So I, I want to be honest, like I, I did not want to drink anymore because it was, it, I felt. <laughs> <laughs> drink too much water. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, have you been inspired to to become more of a cyclist yourself by producing the Major Taylor documentary? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I don't have any athletic background whatsoever or any cycling experience i'm pretty much a newbie um two months ago i heard through a few friends 
uh, that live in Iowa, um, connections that live in Iowa, that there is a great ride across Iowa. And there is uh, this year will be the 50th anniversary. And um, it looks like there will be 60,000 enthusiasts cyclists out there, uh, you know, riding across the state. And I thought it would be uh, it would be a good spot to go and talk about my documentary, Raise Awareness, right? Because if you have a bunch of people right that in the same spot, like that is a that is a nice spot to be, you know. <laughs> so um I kind of took that decision on the whim, like, okay, let's do it. <laughs> So how how was how was uh, uh, the documentary received there? I mean, you, you haven't produced it yet, so you talk to people about it. What? How was? Many people were like, "Whoa, why? Why, why haven't us heard about this story? This have to be told. Um, this story have to be told." And and I receive a lot of great support. Uh, you know, and and I'm a filmmaker, so I, I kind of understand a little bit. What get what goes into raising money uh, to make this film is very hard, right? You don't speak to somebody for the first time and they give you money right away. It's pretty much having to build relationship with people and and it's it means you know interacting with them more than once. Uh, so the first step is raising awareness. Obviously, uh, I met a few people that were already familiar with the story of Mr. Taylor. So at that point, I don't have to do a pitch anymore. I just have to lead them to the crowdfunding and let them know, okay, I'm doing this. You already know about the story. You know this needs to be told. We need your help. And for the people who never heard about it, you know, I would not go and be like, donate for this. I would start by telling them about the story and what it is. And hopefully they would have time to brainstorm on it, think about it, and maybe uh, build a sort of uh, emotional connection with the subject and and maybe want to know more about it. And that's how we can lead them uh, step by step to be able to contribute later. And by the way, you know, uh, crowdfunding, especially in film, uh, is not, um, when you crowdfund, uh, many people, or at least insiders know that it's not about raising money right now, right? Uh, it's about also raising awareness and, and that awareness can lead into uh, money in the future. But you want to make sure that people um, know what you're doing first and, uh, and, and drive them to connect with what you are doing and want to give you something. Because anyway, uh, you can only get significant donation from people that actually are connected really emotionally with your subject, right? Somebody can see you and be like, oh, this guy is doing good. He's working hard to get this done. Uh, most of the time, unless they are really rich and don't know what to do with their money, most of the time you will get maybe a small donation, but really the people that will give you a significant amount of money are the people that um, you will have built some sort of, uh, I would say, emotional connection with your film and what you are doing. And it takes some time. Uh, it's not the first conversation that will lead you to that check. Um, the first thing you want to do is to write your 500 miles, right? Because nobody will write that for you. So even if you hear about such documentary, I don't think uh, that would be your first stop through the ride, right? You want to get through it because it's it's hard. It looks like it's leisure, and but it's hard. And Iowa is not as flat as people think it is. Uh, we're we're talking to Cyril Vincent, uh, the aspiring producer of the Major Taylor documentary. He's already done some interviews, and he's coming to Reno on September 22nd. He's going to speak at the Reno Public Market at 7 p.m., followed by a uh, short film document or uh, short film festival. Say somebody's listening right now and they're like, all right, I, yeah, I know all about Major Taylor already and I'm going to give you a small donation or maybe a large donation. How do they actually do that right now? Where where do they go? What's well, there are multiple ways and we are trying to make it as easy as possible so everybody can be able to participate uh, in the way they feel comfortable. Uh, and we are still open to other ways if people have suggestions. Uh, but we do have a GoFundMe right now, um, you know, that is ongoing. It was set up for the ride, 
but uh you know particularity of gofundme is you can you can you can keep raising money as long as you want there's no set time so i can keep that gofundme running till next year even if i still want to go to ragbri so it's uh it's writing i'm probably going to change the title It's writing 500 miles across iowa for the Mizutero documentary you can contribute on that uh, at the end of the day, you know, all, all the money will go into the same pocket of making the film. Uh, you can also contribute directly on our website, www.worcesterwhirlwind.com. Uh, um, if you are interested in tax uh, deductible donation, uh, you can also do that uh, through our fiscal sponsor, which is the Worcester Historical Museum. You can write a check to the Worcester historical museum if you are not sure about the spelling you can reach out to us or to kai uh worcester historical museum yeah so if you me... wanted to do that tax deductible uh, donation you can do it to our fiscal sponsor and if you want more information about it reach out and we can give you more detail um the other way uh i believe that you can you can help the project is by organizing an event like you know like but I want to say that uh, in exchange of that, obviously, we are making a great film, but also we uh, make sure that we give uh, credit to the people, everybody that donated to the film, uh, get a thank you mention um, in the credit, the end credit of the film. It's not a producer credit or anything like that, but it's just, you know, thank you to Kai or this person or that person for making this, uh, helping making this film available. Uh, but so it's www.worcester and then whirlwind, the, the common spelling, whirlwind.com. So www.worcester whirlwind.com. And so you can go on there and, and you can make a donation to Ciro Vincent and the production of the Major Taylor documentary, which is uh, sorely needs to be made and probably should have been made uh, when film first became a thing. Uh, and, and, you know, many people think the first film was about bicycle, actually. <laughs> it's, it's, oh, really? It's, yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it's... Uh, Ciro Vincent, the uh, producer of the upcoming documentary Major Taylor, absolutely hey i'm looking forward to come down to reno and uh and meet people and, and discuss about this and and you know and beyond just the story of me tell uh this is uh this is we're talking about cycling uh which is a way uh which is a tool that can really empower communities uh Mijitello dream because me tell wrote a biography of himself and his career he's a fire um 450 page big book uh he published it in 1928 uh and you know in the foreword of the book uh, he mentioned that he really want to see um more diversity into cycling and hopefully more people adopting cycling as as a healthy way of living uh, and commuting and, and and just and just be free so i I am fully aware that this is a story about Major Taylor, but it's also a story about, you know, sport, cycling, and 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 it's really uh stay relevant because the story happened a hundred years ago. But why am I doing it really? Apart from being an inspiring story, um, it's also about you know connecting it with uh the cycling wall or the cycling industry today and what is going on and just as you mentioned you know uh commuting now when i started this documentary i was nothing of a cyclist i wasn't even i never imagined myself riding a bike now i'm even uh thinking about after after i came from iowa <laughs> i told my wife that now i'm probably thinking about getting an additional bike that will help me to go to work now, you know, like I, I, that's something that I never thought that I would be thinking about. Uh, so cycling is really something that can be liberating in so many ways is a healthy way of life. And, and there's just so much about it. So I was happy that 
when I went to Ragbri, uh, I saw so much interest in people about the the story of Mijutelo and how that connect to what is going on today in the cycling universe. So yeah, I'm looking forward to be in Reno and uh, and build these connections and and talk more about this story. Um, yeah, that I'm so passionate about. Yeah, and you know that that's an uh, an important point is that the. I think the cycling groups have recognized that um, we need to be more inclusive. And so it's not even just a realization, but we're putting it in our our missions. And so uh, the mission of the Trek and Meadows Bicycle Alliance is to improve equity. Uh, we're, we're trying to make strides any way that we can. And so, you know, uh, any any feedback that you might have on what we can do better would be much appreciated. And, uh, uh, well, I so. think you are doing uh, already good. I mean, um, obviously, everything, no human uh, work is ever perfect, but um, it's it's all about trying, right? It's all about trying your best to do the right thing. And as long as you're on that path, uh, you may not be able to accomplish everything that you want to, but as long as you, you lead the way, Maybe tomorrow somebody would take it from where you you left and keep that work going. But somebody have to start somewhere. And I want to uh, emphasize and say also thank you to everyone that have donated so far to the event uh, you are putting uh, for um, September 22nd in uh, the Reno Public Market. I know you mentioned that there has been two significant donors so far, uh, you know, so I want to thank those people for that. And my hope is that I will meet them and thank them directly the day of the event. And I want to thank, uh, you know, the Truckee Middle Bicycle Alliance for putting this event out there. Sometimes I know it's not easy, especially for small nonprofit. You know, you have to uh, be working to raise money for your own activities and things you are doing. But because you care, you want to go out there and adjust some of the things that needed to be adjusted. And I don't take this for granted. I really appreciate the effort you are doing. Uh, you know, you, you're not coming out here for free. Uh, it's costing you 800 bucks, uh, you know, to, to come out here. So, you know, a lot of the funds that you raise also have to go towards the simple promotion and, and going places to promote. So, uh, we, we really appreciate you having here and, and and hopefully you know we'll be able to explore the the area a little bit more and um uh and, and help you to raise some more funds again it's Ciro vincent uh the producer of the upcoming major taylor documentary you can go to uh worcester uh, i gotta find it here uh w-o-r-c-e-s-t-e-r whirlwind.com to donate to the documentary you can also see a uh uh, trailer there um, and you can also make a tax deductible donation through um, uh, some some links that are here but again www.worcester whirlwind.com thank not, you not. thank you so very much Kyle and I appreciate the opportunity and uh, thank you to all the listeners of Bike Live Radio um, and uh, everyone that support the Truckee Middle Bicycle Alliance. Um, really, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for everything. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for, for taking the time. Thank you very much. All right, bye-bye. You're listening to KWNK 97.7 FM. We're talking to Ciro Vincent, a film producer aspiring to make a documentary about legendary black cyclist Major Taylor. When we did this interview, he had only raised a few thousand dollars. Now, just less than a month later, he's up to $40,000. He needs to raise $1.2 million to make the documentary about Major Taylor. He's coming to Reno on September 22nd to give a talk, and then we're going to have a bike film fest. You can find out more at bikewashoe.org. Next, as you may know, the Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance, Food Truck Friday, and Reno Bike Project have been sponsoring Bike Valet at the event every Friday, Food Truck Friday, for about a month and a half now. We hang out and we do light maintenance and we watch people's bikes and we talk to people about their bikes and their lives. News 4's Elizabeth Mitchell has a new program, though, that might help you out. Hi, Elizabeth. 
Good morning, Chris. Yes, the Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance is hosting free, free bike valet for people who ride their bikes to Food Truck Friday. This is today and for the next four Fridays. I am with Kai, and he's the president of Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance. So, what is this bike valet, and walk me through the process of how this works if somebody were to bring their bike here tonight. Yeah. You, uh, you dust off your bike, and then you bring it down here, you ride it down here, and then we're going to check it over for free as well and do some light maintenance as well for free. And so when you show up, then we give you a little red ticket, and then we attach the other half of the red ticket to your bicycle, and then uh, you go enjoy food, and, uh, and then come back, and your bike is here and secure, and then you can ride back to your car, whether you park down at downtown or Reno High School. It's, it's really nice to know where you're gonna park. People are coming down here and driving around looking for parking and getting all sweaty because they gotta walk down here and then they're angry and sweaty and we want people to arrive refreshed and happy and that's what's happening with the bicycles right into the center of the event. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect and so tell me a little bit about how um, how many bikes can you fit on one rack and you guys take up a couple parking spaces when it happens correct? That's right, uh, and we can fit 15 bikes in one parking spot, which is amazing. And so when you've got 15 bikes in a parking spot for one car, uh, you can imagine what kind of impact that has for the event. It's just uh, a, an incredible way to be able to solve a parking problem in Reno for all events, not just Food, Food Truck Friday, but Food Truck Friday is sponsoring this because it is slightly intensive, and so we need more events to, to step up and offer this kind of option for people so that we can have more people riding bikes to the events. Perfect. Well, come see Kai and the Truckee Meadows um, Bicycle Alliance tonight by riding your bike here to Food Truck Friday. Live in Reno, Elizabeth Mitchell. And before we go, I'm going to ride off on this bicycle or at least try to. And we're going to do a play by play here. She's putting up the kickstand and she's putting her leg over the top. She's got her hand on the handlebars. She's thinking about it. Oh, 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 almost hit the, the, the cone. And there she goes. Incredible. Watch her riding to Food Truck Friday, reenacting how it all happens. Come on over to the bike valet. Come on. Come on over here, Elizabeth. Come to the bike valet. Come on. Yes. Excellent. She made it. Perfect. Wow. Thank you. Well, come drive your bike just like I did or ride your bike down here to see uh, Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance. Kai's, Kai's comfortable announcing. He's done this before. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Good riding. I wonder why. Safety first. Good job. We also interview people for the radio. Uh, so next we have some chats with people who have come to the bike valet. When you were a kid or, uh, you know, any other time, do you have a, a memory on a bicycle that you'd like to share? Uh, I remember I was a student at UC Davis and I went on what was called the double century and my ass was really sore after that. <laughs> Just your ass? Like well, from... everything, but the <laughs> ass really hurt. I had the wrong seat. So, oh. yeah. Uh, so you weren't, your legs weren't sore well, so much. Well, they were sore, but I really remember my ass being sore. Right. Well, that's a good story. Uh, the double century. Yes. What, uh, what was that like? Well, it was 200 miles and uh, it was, it was a long race, and but it was good. But um, I should have prepared for it and trained for it a little bit more. But came away with sore legs and a sore ass. Did you do it on like a, uh, uh, a beach cruiser? No, I had a tin, an old, uh, what did I have? I think it was a Schwinn Continental bike. Oh, yes, so 10 speed. Huh. Yeah, UC Davis is one of the best known, uh, like one of the best places in the United States for biking now. Yeah, it is, yeah. it really is. And so I, I did a lot of cycling there and uh, it was a great way to go around and the people there are really tuned into bikes. So you didn't have to worry about getting hit by a car. Yeah. Well, I can see you're very eager to get back on your bike and ride and I don't want to hold you here longer. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for uh, having the service, appreciate it. You're welcome, have All a great day. You as well. I'm doing a radio show about bikes. Uh, it's called Bike Life Radio. It's on KWNK, 97.7 FM. And uh, we're at the Bike Valet at Food Truck Friday, and I brought my uh, tricycle down here that uh, is a bike repair station, and I, at the last minute I decided to zip tie some elk horns to the handlebars. Yeah, what, uh, and what's your name, sir? Eric. Er Eric, and so Eric came by and is yeah. taking pictures of this, and lots of kids have come by and talked about it. So it seems to be fairly popular. Uh, what was your first thought when you saw it? My first thought is that it's pretty badass and fun and 
represents a nice sort of counterculture attitude. <laughs> and if anyone gets in your way, you just headbutt them. <laughs> Excellent. Especially, yeah, especially a car that happens to uh, cut in front of you and then stop and park in the bike lane. Eric, uh, what brings you down to Food Truck Friday? Food trucks. Yeah? And you would have ridden your bike if you had known we were here, huh? Had a bike corral. Absolutely. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's have a big you deal. used one before? Yeah, in you Chicago. Have? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. So they common there? Yes, they're very really? common. Come Most on. outdoor events there have bike corrals, yeah. This is the first time that an event has actually paid for a bike corral um, or a, a bike valet uh, in Reno. And so uh, do, do you know how they're paid for in Chicago? I have no clue. Huh. All I know is that typically there's no fee. And I, uh, Wrigley Field has one. Uh-huh. Uh, uh-huh. Almost every outdoor event that I've been to has one. Uh, Evanston and all their outdoor events at Out of Space. And I think they have one at the Salt Shed has a bike corral. Wow. Just part of the owner's attitude, I guess, huh. and the they, city. Yeah. Do they have them staffed? They're staffed, yeah. Wow. And they're roped off, not with a rope, they're roped off with a chain link fence. Uh huh. A little bit more secure than our yeah. little flimsy rope. But no, it's not a little flimsy rope. It's more like the idea it's segregated. It's you fine, but you know, with burners coming in and the Burning Man people showing up and a Burning Man ripoff bike scene. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. They might come in here and try and steal yeah. all the bikes immediately, right? You never know, man. It could be yeah. a bum rush of burners. <laughs> they might attack. Yeah. Anyway. Uh-huh. Yay, thank you. I Thanks always for- just tell people, between the first, the second week of August and towards burner, just keep your bike secure. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so this is the time, right? Anyway, yeah. so that's cool. No, say thank you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're welcome. Appreciate you're welcome. This. Yeah, this is the you got to thank Food Truck Friday because they are paying us to be here. It's and beautiful. Yeah, in the past, it's always been done as a uh, like a volunteer service, and a lot of the the bike shops in town wouldn't do it anymore just because it's not yeah, worth their time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. I, I understand that. Yeah, it's a great great thing. They should keep it up. All right, we will. Thanks yeah. a lot, Eric. I really appreciate you coming yeah. by. All right, thanks. Ride your bike next time. Oh. Uh, uh, you know, I didn't ask you for a bike story, uh, yeah. and this is Bike Life Radio, and that's what we oh, do. I have so, a great yeah. bike story. You do? Okay. Really? All right, so ahead. this 1988 original stump jumper from College Cyclery, I was using it as a commuter bike in Chicago. and Wait, you bought it here and brought it there? Yeah, I went to there for law school and came back here, oh, cool. and now I'm back here. But anyway, nice. so we're in a lakefront. So I lived in Evanston. Yeah. And went down to Chicago. I commute uh-huh. 15 and a half miles one way and then 15 and a half miles back nice. three to four days a week. And half that trip is on the Chicago Lakefront Trail. That Chicago Lakefront Trail at the time was a multi-use trail between cyclists, boarders, runners, walkers, beachgoers. And this was in the midst of crushed summer day. Mm. And somebody cut in front of me when I was cruising along and I had to slam on my brakes, and of course I hit my front brake, but because of my single track acumen learned here in the Sierra Nevada, <laughs> I did an endo, but I uh-huh. hopped over the front the handlebars. front handlebars wow. and just ran down the, the, the lakefront trail, and then my bike was of course sort of screwed up, but I was uh-huh. undamaged, and people are like, what the hell? And they gave me a standing O. I was like, that's pretty funny. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. Yeah. That lakefront trail, I just rode on it this past year. It's beautiful. It's still multi-use, isn't it? Except for uh, a billionaire cyclist. I don't remember his name. He owns a huge head fund in Chicago. Yeah. But he got tired of competing. So he paid for a separate cycling trail to be put in. So you could have runners, walkers on one side and cyclists on the other. Huh. Anyway, what do, you, what do you think of that? That it's got to be privately funded in order. I think to it's sort of it, the city was going to step up eventually. He just wanted it sooner rather than later, and so he did it. Nice. And you know the city's behind cycling there a lot, so you know there's huh. no there's no I have no shade to throw on Chicago. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. All right. Thanks. All right, thanks for being on Bike Life Radio. Yeah. I really right appreciate on. it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We'll see you in a little bit. Lauren is one of our board members, and she's. Uh, womaning the uh, Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance Bike Valet uh, today on a, on a gorgeous Friday afternoon. Well, I was riding around, I think, by Washoe Lake, and then we saw someone, like the aftermath of someone being hit 
and he later brought his helmet into Kiwanis and it sounded like the only reason he made it was because of that helmet so it was pretty powerful to see that and then be able to tell like kids about it at bike camp why it's so important to wear a helmet yeah that's a great bike story mm -hmm. thanks for sharing yeah all right see you could do it i could do it <laughs> <laughs> hey shane you're at, uh, at Food Truck Friday on yes. Bike Life Radio, KWNK 97.7 FM, uh, and it's owned and operated by the Reno Bike Project. And you've brought a bike to uh, the Bike Valet at, uh, at, at Food Truck Friday. Why did you do that? Well, what's your name? Let's start there. Ella. Ella. Your name is Ella. And why did you bring your bike here? Um, because I was riding my bike to Food Truck Friday. Uh -huh. and you, but you knew we were here, didn't you? Uh, yeah, I just learned it on the way here. Oh, you did? I did. Who I, told you? I, I remembered from the last time when we were here, uh -huh. seeing the free valet and thinking it was really a cool idea. So then when she said she wanted to ride her bike this time, I figured we'd use the free valet. Ah, and so you just walked up to the random girl on the street and were like, hey, bring your bike, right? <laughs> yeah. No, who's, this, this who's my your relation? I, I'm JD, this is my daughter, Ella. <laughs> and we just, we just live a little bit, like about a mile from here. So we usually walk here, but today she wanted to ride her bike. Did you have to run because she was riding? No, I just had to keep a real keen eye out in front of me, but she... I kept looking back. She would stop and wait for me, yeah, for oh, sure. that's good. Excellent. Do you have uh, any bike stories that you'd like to share? Like, um, you were riding your bike and there was a bird or something, I don't know. Um, I don't think so. I don't no? think there's any... One time my daughter was riding a bike, speaking of birds, and she hit a goose. Like, a goose was walking <laughs> and she was riding and there was a collision with a goose. And uh, yeah. and the goose was like stuck under her bike, and she was like, "Oh my God!" Yeah, speaking of birds and bikes. Did, it, did the goose die? No, the goose was fine. It walked away, kind of looking at her the way that she was looking at it, like, "What the hell?" Yeah, you know. What happened there? Yeah, the goose was like, "What the hell, human?" And the, and she was like, me? "Yeah," and and she was like, "Well, why did you get under my tire?" <laughs> you know. <laughs> Do you have a bike story? Um, yeah, I rode in college. I rode my bike. A couple of buddies and I went from San Francisco to San Luis Obispo down the one. And it was beautiful. The whole time I had a leaky appendix. I didn't know until I got I got done and had to get, had appendicitis. Had to get my appendix removed. Oh wow! <laughs> Some, but the whole time I was like, fine. Then I was thinking about it. Like that could have ended uh, poorly. poorly. Instead, it was an incredible trip, <laughs> seeing the ocean and getting distracted. Uh, you know, trying to stay on the road in Big Sur because you're just kind of looking out of, out around you while you ride your bike. So nice. Yeah, I haven't ridden my bike much since then, to be honest. <laughs> You know, the way you put that, that you had a leaky appendix, it made me think of like, well, you're the motor and you were leaking, you know, yeah. right? You had kind a of, problem. That's kind of. What, what, that's what I thought. I was like, wait, was your bike leaking? No. Just, it was, it, it was, you couldn't tell. It was inside, so you couldn't see the leak. Some internal leaking <laughs> yeah, exactly. in the motor of your yeah. bicycle. I think I would have taken a leak from the bike over the appendix for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, that is a good story. I'm glad you're okay. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. That was before she was born, wasn't yes, it? Yes, uh, a good decade before she was born. Yeah, so, you know, if that leaky appendix, if something had happened, then you might not have been born. I know. Yeah. That would have been a very tragic bike story. You know, maybe uh, because you were riding a bike, your body was able to handle the leaky appendix. Maybe. It could have been, like, the motion. All the exercise, you know. Yeah. Uh, who knows? I th you were I th sweating more, and so you were getting been. rid of toxins. There's got to be some scientific explanation, right? Yeah. <laughs> or would... Uh, or if you have a leaky them? appendix, is it better to ride a bike than not ride a bike, right? I yeah. want there to be a medical study out there that, that's like studying that somehow. we got to find a lot of people yeah. that have leaky appendixes. It's a weird screening process, but once you're in... Bike across a, a thousand miles. Yeah, yes. exactly. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's good. She's uh, going to be a scientist. For sure. With some questionable ethics on her, on her like uh, be studies, though. She wants to be an environmental engineer. Say that again. You want to be an engineer? An environmental engineer. Oh, you do? To, like, cool. Well, I'm glad you rode your bike today because like, that's a, uh, a good environmental here, thing. Like, and, oh, uh, really bicycles are engineered. Really yes, so. yeah. All right. Thank you for coming, Ella and JD. I appreciate yep. it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh -huh. Bye. Thanks for riding. We have a radio show uh, called Bike Life Radio on KWNK 97.7 yeah, FM yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, by Reno Bike Project. Yeah, okay. And so uh, you've come to the Bike Valet and you said that your front wheel makes uh, what kind of noise? <laughs> it's it sounds like you're murdering a turkey. Yeah. It sounds like 
<laughs> Have you ever murdered a turkey? No, but in my head, that's exactly what it sounds like. It sounds like a turkey in a lot of distress, running for its life. And and so you, like, uh, one of your friends was like, they could get glazed, right? The, the brakes or whatever. Oh, yeah, so you thought deep. about this a little bit. Like, why does my bike sound like a turkey? Yeah. It's yeah. not a turkey. It's not a turkey. No. <laughs> it's because it's been neglected. Yeah. Uh, well, that's okay, though, right? Because you brought it to the bike valley and we were able to fix it a little bit. And thank you so much. Bit. Yeah, and you know more about it, maybe. Uh, now, you were saying that it's important to have a bike that doesn't have a lot of moving parts if you're going to go to the burn, right? That's that's my take. That's your opinion. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, why? Less things that can go wrong. Less things that can break. Yeah. I've had things break out there, and it's been a pain in the ass to yeah. uh, figure out when What's everybody is hungover in the morning, and you're trying to get back to your camp. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's, wait, you're hungover in the morning and not at camp. And not at camp. Uh, yeah. And, and, you're and your camp. bike's broken. And my bike is broken. How yeah. did that happen? That sounds like a bike story that you should tell on Bike Life Radio. Uh, I was in really good biking shape and treated my first Burning Man bike, which was gifted to me, which was gifted to many other people, like it was my road bike. Ah. And I snapped the chain ah. out in deep playa. <laughs> <laughs> and I ended up uh, putting the seat post all the way down and I Barney rubbled it all the way back. <laughs> like a, like nice. a strider bike? Yeah. <laughs> like good <two> job. Miles. <laughs> <laughs> All right, excellent. Yeah. So uh, that's the idea of this bike over here. I was in, uh, I, I went to uh, Burning Man and I went to sleep and all I had was a tarp. And I like, before I got under my tarp, I saw Robot Heart out on the middle of the playa and I was like, oh, there's Robot Heart. And I pulled my tarp over and I went to sleep. And I woke <laughs> up in the morning and Robot Heart was gone, but there was a giant pile of something. So I went out there and there was a big pile of bikes. So I started to fix them and all I had was a Swiss Army knife. And so I was fixing all these bikes. I started to set them up in a row. And then people started to show up in deep playa with broken bikes. And they're like, can you fix my bike? And I was like, no, I don't think I can fix this one, but you could take that one. And so I was collecting broken bikes and fixing that's broken amazing. bikes. And, and so now that's gonna be the deep playa bike repair bike. Oh, yes. Somewhere out there in deep playa will be a deep playa bike repair bike. Yeah. It is, do you have a bike story you'd like to tell? Besides your turkey bike? Uh, you know, geez. Or actually, I was downhill mountain biking and I ran into a moose uh, in a berm. And it, this was, yeah, yeah, this was in. The uh, moose was hiding in the berm? No, 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 no. Oh. This was in northern Idaho or Montana, Silver Spring, uh, Silver Mountain, something like that. Yeah, moose don't hide in berms there. Well, so only here I was the only one. I was the only one in the mountain. There was like one killer run. And I was doing it over and over and over again. And I was getting faster and faster and wow. faster. And then like the fourth or fifth time, I came screaming into this berm and there's a moose in it. Huh. And it was, uh, it terrified us both. And uh, I like obviously hit the brakes. It kind of like ran off, but it ran off down the trail. And this is like a downhill trail. Yeah. And so there's no way to like turn around or nowhere to go. So I had to go down the trail. And so him and I were just like, following each other and I was like how long till this moose like turns around and just like creams me and like that's the end of it but eventually it turned uphill and I was able to continue so you didn't think about just stopping and waiting till it went away I waited a good amount of time <laughs> in my defense <laughs> yeah okay well that's good wow that's a good story yeah moose are scary huh big time they're huge yeah Wow. Well, all right, I'll get away from your bike so that you can get away. <laughs> Thank you here. for tuning yeah. it up. I really appreciate it. I can't wait to not frighten the general public on my way home. Oh, let's hope it works. I have no idea. Uh, I didn't ride it around or anything. So let's take it off here and see what happens. No, hold on, hold on. So, so Gabriel, uh, you brought your bike to the bike valet at uh, Food Truck Friday. And one of the things I noticed is you have a lot of stuff on your bike. And you, like if you were to lock it up somewhere, you'd have to take all that stuff off and then try and put it in a backpack or something, right? Yes, correct. I, I would. But I usually I usually just ride it to events or usually just to work, from home to work. Uh, so I can actually just leave it inside my workplace. I can actually see it. But if I actually plan on actually like going to an event where I have to actually have to leave it uh, obviously not food truck Fridays because I usually enjoy coming to food truck Fridays usually every Friday I know I know I know you guys have the, the take care for the bikes that you watch them over 
But if not, I'll just take most of the stuff out and just leave it like bare minimum. And I can, and I'll just basically go everywhere on the bicycle. Nice. So you commute a lot, huh? I do. I used to commute back two years ago. I used to commute all the way from Sparks to Northwest Reno, about nine miles uh, in the morning, nine miles in the afternoon, wow. almost end to end. I do enjoy riding my bicycle ever since I was a kid. I enjoy actually going on two wheels more than four wheels. And I am actually a mechanic, so. Oh, right on. You're like a car mechanic? Car mechanic. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so, you, and you, you're a car mechanic who rides a bike. I actually enjoy riding my bicycle more than I ride my car. <laughs> here, come on over here, Gabriel. We gotta yeah. get out of his way. He wants to get his bike. All right, why do you think you like riding your bike more than you like driving a car? Uh, I, I don't know, it's just, not being enclosed in a vehicle, it's just, I don't know, it's just, I get more joy out of it. Uh, yes, it's a little bit more dangerous out there, people are not looking out for you, but more than the exercise I get out of it, I just, I like the freedom of it, I, I don't know, it's just different. Yeah. Uh, you said that you've been riding since you were a little kid and right. have always kind of commuted. Why do you think people stop? I don't have any clothes. People got lazy. Yeah. Just matter of fact, people get lazy. People, matter of fact, just people got lazy or don't want to ride their bikes. They're, they're, they just want to go. They don't want to go through the trouble. They rather just be inside their vehicles and with their ACs, all comfortable. Have you? You would like to go to your go to your job place if you run a little bit late. Have your cup of coffee. Have your breakfast. Have a lot of stuff. And if you take your bicycle, that's a lot of take off to do to take on your bicycle, yeah. and that's a lot of prep work if you actually didn't make it in time so just people just want the comfortable of having a vehicle and having the comfortability and luxury of having four wheels having an enclosed situation where they don't have to rush or worry about anything else being uh, somebody who's riding all the time uh, what do you think we need to do in order to get more people to ride Ooh, tough question. Yeah. Like, I mean, if they like AC and they want to have their radio and they want to have their cup of coffee and I burn mean, fossil fuels at the cup, same time. Cup holders are always in, are always out there. You can put a cup holder on your you bicycle. I gotta tell you the truth. I put a cup, I put a cup holder on my bike and I put a cup of coffee in there and it splashes out onto my crotch. Uh, enclosed. <laughs> Yeah, Enclo okay, all right, yeah. <laughs> enclosed fluid <laughs> containers. <laughs> all right. Uh, okay, I'll try that. All right, thanks. Yeah. Uh, any, uh, any other advice? Other advices, man. I don't know, radio or music, you always have. AC, I don't know what, what there is to do. It's well, natural wind. AC. You have the wind. Wind or what I usually do, I just get my shirt wet every time I get out. That way I get I go a little bit fresh before I go to my where my destination is at. But other like to bro get people out there, I don't know, more than the exercise that everybody, that we all need. Um, it's actually taking a little minute and enjoying the outdoors because it's just people just, I don't know, nowadays I just feel like people are just stay more indoors than outdoors. Excellent. Well, I'll let you go enjoy your time. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate it. Yeah, have a good time and you nice meeting you. You're listening to KN, KWNK 97.7 FM, Bike Life Radio, and we're at uh, uh, Food Truck Friday. Sorry, I just rode here on my bicycle, and, uh, and, and so my brain needs to get into speaking mode. Uh, but we're at Bike Ballet, and some people just came in, and they brought their bikes, too. And uh, so, what's your name, sir? Uh, I'm Paul. You're Paul. Yes. And you brought your bike. Yes. And uh, why did you bring your bike? Um, it seemed like a fun way to get out here and experience the food truck Friday. Um, not to mention not dealing with the hassle of parking. And then knowing that the bikes are in a constantly watch secure location is real peace of mind for me to where I can come and truly let loose and enjoy myself. Yeah, let loose and enjoy yourself without worrying about your bike. Exactly. That could really ruin your time. Like, Absolutely. what's going on with my bike? Thinking about that like every 10 seconds, huh? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so do you have a, a bike story? One of the things that we do on Bike Life Radio is we talk to people about their bikes and some sort of experience that they had, and it can be any kind of experience. Um, well, so our bikes are uh, the e-bikes, if you're familiar with them, Saran and Talaria. Um, as you can probably tell, uh, I don't know about the listeners at home, it, it's more like a motorcycle, like an electric motorcycle, if you will. Um, we try to treat them like bikes and be respectful, not be the those people that are riding in the grass, tearing it up and doing wheelies everywhere. 
Um, but you could. You could, yes. But again, you don't want to be that people. Uh, especially in Nevada, there's plenty of hills, dirt roads to go get out on and explore. Um, we've had it a few times where we've been exploring out uh, in the hills on Peavine or such. And then uh, we maybe take a take a, uh, a crash or have to hop off the bike for whatever reason. And uh, it's always nice knowing that with Reno being the way it is, you usually not too far away from an actual paved road that you could always take back after a long day of getting beat up on the trail. Excellent. All right, well, I'll let you go and have a good time. Uh, thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. Have a great time. You too. All right. You're listening to Bike Life Radio, KWNK 97.7 FM. We're at uh, uh, Food Truck Friday, and it's uh, the Bike Valet. What are we talking about? I don't know. Yeah, Bike Life Radio. You're on Bike Life Radio. Uh, and uh, it's KWNK 97.7 FM. Uh, we've got uh, Tom Albright here, uh, a UNR professor and vice president of the Bike Alliance. He rode his bike to Bike Valet. How did you find out about it? Well, it kind of helps when you have an inside track and you are active with the Trucking Meadows Bicycle Alliance. But I think they've done a great job, as has Food Truck Fridays, of getting the word out that this is that this is a thing. And people are only going to use it if they know they can count on it, right? And we've been here, we've had folks here every week for a few weeks in a row, and we've seen really healthy numbers. So I think it's great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, that's a really good point. It's got to be here all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what, uh, what do you think uh, will be the future of this uh, bike ballet? And actually, you know what? I haven't even described what the heck that is for people who might be out there and not know what a bike ballet is. So do you want to do that part? Sure. Uh, cool. Well, bike ballet, it, it's kind of a win-win. Uh, it's, it's a win for event organizers because it provides another attractive way for folks to come and participate in their event, so it draws some people. It's a win for people who ride their bikes, obviously, because they have a place to stash their bike. It's pretty stress-free, it's kind of fun, and heck, I don't know about you, but I haven't seen a bike valet where there's free service, and they have like bike repairs here, and, and you know they'll inflate your tires, which is pretty amazing. Um, but it's also a win, and I don't think this gets said enough, it's also a win for folks who drive because that's like that many fewer, you know, pointy elbows directed your way when you're fighting for a parking spot and you can park a little bit closer thanks to all these folks who came here on bike. Excellent. Yeah, why do you think that they, they haven't really done uh, light repairs before at bike valets? Um, I don't know. Maybe they were really busy. I think there might be some you know, concerns about exposure to if something goes wrong, but... Um, like if I fix somebody's brakes and then they don't work. Yeah. yeah, I suppose that could be a problem, but I think the kind of stuff that, that they've been doing here is pretty pretty straightforward stuff, like inflating tires, and, and if there's a problem, you know, you're fixing it, so... Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I think that's been one of the fears as I've fixed some bikes here, is that uh, if I popped a tire, then I gotta fix that, and that's a real pain in the butt. But, uh, you know, the I think as far as the brakes are concerned, or I'm only fixing bikes that really have serious problems. Yeah. So, like, uh, a little child's bike whose brakes don't work. And then, uh, and, and that raises a really interesting concern that I didn't realize that there's probably kids out there with brakes that don't work, and they're trying to go for a ride with their parents, and they don't know how to tell their parents that their bike doesn't stop. And their parents wonder why they crash into everything. And it might be because they sim the, their brakes don't work. You yeah, know? And they don't know that a brake is actually supposed to work. They might think, oh, maybe I just need to squeeze harder, or I did or it this wrong. This is the way a bike is. Yeah, it's, a, it's supposed to be capable of stopping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then they're like terrified, and they're like, I'm never getting on that thing again. Yeah, and yeah. we wonder why. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, well, I'll let you put your bike away. Thanks, right. Tom. I appreciate Great it. Great to be here. Yeah. Don't tell anybody that if they come to Bike Valet, they're going to get interviewed on Bike Life Radio. Okay, Morgan? <laughs> I definitely won't say anything about that. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> That's it for Bike Life Radio on KWNK 97.7 FM. Today, we talked to people who took advantage of the free Bike Valet at Food Truck Friday. And we also talked to a film producer, C. Real Vincent, who's doing a documentary about Major Taylor, the legendary black cyclist from the 1890s. A lot of books out there about him. You should learn about him. Vincent is giving a talk here in Reno on September 22nd. And now we're going to have a bike film fest. Go to bikewashow.org for details. If you missed that part about Vincent in this discussion today, well, you can find Bike Life Radio on Spotify. 
Thanks for listening to Bike Life Radio from KWNK, the Reno Bike Project, and Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance, bikewasho.org. I'm Kai Plaskon. Right on.